But if you go to the Philippines, you will find that Mary is very much alive and well there. That is the way some people describe presence today, and then certainly what she is doing in the Philippines is unbelievable. When we, I would have been home yesterday so as to avoid the jet lag that I'm feeling now, but I got invited because of some of the healings that happen in the staff of the government to come and be the guest of Mrs. Aquino to say mass for her at the presidential palace for the first Friday and then to have a television interview with her in the afternoon. And after that mass, we ended up praying for major sections of the government and the cabinet. It was one of the most unbelievable experiences. But for many of us, it is difficult to know what has happened in that country unless you have a Catholic faith. I had an interview with the cardinal, a sin, and with two other cardinals and with a number of the bishops and archbishops of the country and it was absolutely amazing. The Congress filled one of the halls. It, it went beyond all expectations in spite of Planet Tuba, the earthquake, in spite of the fact that we had a, a rather the uh, volcano, and in spite of the fact that we had an earthquake and we had floods in the city, the attendance exceeded anything that we could imagine. And that night in the healing service, God began to manifest himself so powerfully that down at the front we had a former ambassador to the White House, an ambassador to Washington, who was paralyzed and God healed him and he came out of the wheelchair and began to dance and push the wheelchair out. But there's just so many stories that I could tell you. We went up to Lipa where the apparitions have been reopened since 1948 officially by the Archbishop things are happening there with rose petals and things falling that are amazing but one of the things that truly moved me with the birth of that country in its new birth of democracy because I had gone there in 1983 I had seen what was happening under the Marcos regime I had seen the faith of the people I had seen the tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit for which there were few priests to handle and a great danger that whole segments of the church would be lost to Protestantism. When I went there this time, it was to see what God can do when the situation looks impossible. The bishops of that country united together in realizing that the charismatic renewal was sent from God as the Vatican had affirmed they began to hold priest seminars under the auspices of their diocesan uh, control to the point that where you had a hundred priests and maybe six were charismatic, you now have a hundred charismatic priests and maybe six are not. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is phenomenal. It's the first time I ever prayed with a bishop to get speaking in tongues. I didn't know he was a bishop. I would have been afraid that my hands would have short-circuited. <laughs> but if you can also imagine what God did to change the course of the nation. Cardinal Sin shared with us, and I have it on tape. We took our own uh, photographer, our own camera people. He said, when we saw that we were going into what could be a bloody, bloody civil war, he said, at that point, I called all of the convents and I said to the sisters, prostrate yourselves immediately before the blessed sacrament. Cry out to God and make reparations for the sins of the nation that we may be spared unbelievable bloodshed and suffering. The nuns began a continual vigil through those days that many of us watched to see what would happen with the Marcos regime. The word reached the convent by way of radio that the helicopters were coming to bomb and they were fully prepared to bomb the crowds and the soldiers in rebellion. At that point, the nuns cried out verbally to the Lord, don't let it happen, Lord, don't let it happen. And the general in the helicopter immediately changed his mind and ordered the helicopters to be landed. But that was not the single most exciting event. 
The men were ordered with before them crews of nuns and priests and people with flowers, people who had come to pray the rosary, people who were begging them to go back, to not resist, to not fight. They were given the order to shoot. They began the countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. At the number 6, every one of those men who had their hand on the trigger saw immediately the most beautiful lady they had ever seen in their lives. She stood before them and said, I am the queen of peace, and you will not shoot my children. Every one of them took their hands off the trigger at that point. <laughs> Cardinal Sin told us that at that very point, those men, when they withdrew, realized what was happening. And all of those soldiers went to the cardinal they shared what they had seen. They thanked God because just later they would have been men who had betrayed their country had they fired because of the change of the government. They offered thanksgiving to Our Lady that she had spared them and the people. And in the very spot where this happened, I was able to say Mass at what is now one of the most beautiful Marian shrines with a huge about three story tall or four stories tall statue of Our Lady that dominates the whole city as a memorial of the spot where Mary intervened and brought peace to a nation that was dedicated to her. The topic that has been assigned to me is faith. The message is one of Our Lady I have come that you might believe in God. The writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that without faith it is impossible to please God, that those that you must believe in him and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It is fascinating that Cardinal Ratzinger alludes to an illustration of the modern church that was originally given by one of the fathers of existentialism in our times, Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard is also quoted by Harvey Cox as an analysis of the modern church. The parable that he gives that speaks so eloquently of the impotency seemingly of the church is this. There is a circus that goes outside of a village Suddenly, there is a fire that breaks out inside the circus. As they are attempting to put out the fire, they become aware that the fire will soon spread to the fields and that the village itself will be consumed. Only one man they can spare, and he had already put his makeup on. He was the clown. They send the clown to the village square, and they beg him he, to tell them that they must come quickly to put out the fire. As he arrives in the square in his clown outfit, he tries to get the attention of every man, every woman, to tell them that there is imminent danger, that unless they go quickly, and if they would act now, they could avert the disaster that is soon to come. And the people, knowing that he is the clown and deciding already in their own minds that they know what this is, that this is a publicity ploy. This is only an attempt to try and make us go to the circus. They laugh hysterically. And the more the clown attempts to move the crowd, the faster his actions and animations in desperation, the more furious their laughter and their indifference until the fire consumes the village. Yes. That is the way some may view the modern church. The world has already passed its judgment. It laughs at our warnings of judgment. But there is another image of the church which is happening today, and it is the image that they went everywhere preaching the gospel, and the Lord himself confirmed the word with signs following. 
and there is a new dimension coming to Christianity. The heavens are opening and all around us there is coming an affirmation of the need of repentance, of the imminence of judgment, but this affirmation is marked by heaven and thank God kingdoms are falling and empires are passing away that were committed to evil and we are not the clown that is laughing with indifference but we are being heard in the highest councils of government because there is an awareness that there is a God who is shaking the nation and something is about to happen from the standpoint of theology it is amazing that our faith begins with the creed I believe it is so easy for us to not understand that the word faith is something unique to the Christian understanding of God we Christians take it for granted that faith is so essential that we will even speak of other world religions by saying what is the faith of that particular individual but if we began to study in depth the nature of religion, we will begin to see that the word I believe is unique to Christianity. It was not a part even of the Judaic system where it was obedience to the law, not a personal faith that was the criteria of your presence in the community and your religious value that it was not a part even of the ancient Romans who used the word religio and who felt that it was simply right and ritual and proper ceremony but had no requirement that there be a personal commitment to any deity in the midst of this structure that existed of religious formality in their society. Only when we come to Christianity are you asked to make the personal commitment to make the step of faith, to make that commitment one of total belief that will be transforming in every aspect of your life to say, I believe. Because of this, it is fascinating to see that when Our Lady would appear in Croatia to a nation that had been under the dominance of communism, a dominance that taught that there was no God and that atheism was the only intelligent option for any modern man. That she would say to the children, you will seven times a day recite the creed, the Our Father, the Hail Marys, and the glory be to the Father. In the field of modern psychology, we have one man, Charles Addington, who discovered that if we would use repetition and that repetition throughout the day that we could change the thought processes of any individual. He worked out a program of 40 affirmations and in a California prison system he had them read these affirmations and he found that seven times was one of the best ways that you could make sure that it became thoroughly ingrained in, into the very consciousness of the person. At the end of those 40 affirmations, 40 days of saying over and over seven times through the day, the affirmation, the thought processes were so changed of those prisoners that not one of them who went through the Addington program ever became a repeater and returned. Their consciousness had been transformed. What Our Lady is saying is that this affirmation of belief this affirmation of prayer, this affirmation that there is a living God who is sovereign and real and I am committed to that God must become so much a part of our nature that we no longer lived as we lived before because our minds have been transformed by a living faith that is the ancient faith of the church of Jesus Christ. Only when we have that faith in our personal life will we be able to move. And this is what she's saying, say it over, say it again, say it again, say it again until you are transformed and you're renewed in the depth of your mind and you are no longer conformed to this world but you are transformed by the renewal of your mind as Paul speaks of it in the 8th chapter of Romans. When we look at faith and we would define it theologically, generally we see faith in three categories. Credentia, from which we get the word credibility, credentials. 
This is the objective side of faith. This is faith that we can point to with historical reality. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered, died, and was buried, and he rose again from the dead. This is faith as such an objective body of truth that we can speak of it in sacred scripture as contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. But this is only the objective side of faith. I remember years ago in the era of the 60s and early 70s going to a conference on Catholic education. At that time, one of the speakers said one of the greatest chores we now are confronted with in the educational process at college levels is perhaps to de-brainwash the students from the nuns. And I thought, what a terrible thing to say. And then he said, what we mean by that is to remove from a catechetical by rote statement of the faith because he said, basically, before Vatican II, our commitment was to objective doctrine, to the Thomistic understanding of Christianity, to the Baltimore Creed. And once we had taught the people how to say the creed, once they had learned the proper formula, then we felt that our work in Christian education had been completed. But it is one thing to go into the world with the questions and answers, but there are new questions and you have no answers for them. And there's, all of this has to be transformed from something that is purely academic, purely something you have memorized by rote, into a living experience that is changing your life. I've always put it this way. Going to heaven is not what you know, it is who you know. <laughs> and so that personal element of faith has to be brought in when we look at what is the objective level of our faith we see that the one thing that is being threatened today and I shudder to think of it that there are whole new streams of heresy that are as ancient as the church herself that have again come into the midst of the kingdom of God and are trying to double the faithful. There are sections of the church that have jettisoned in every form the faith of the cross. They are replacing it with new age techniques. They are replacing it with a new age philosophy that negates the reality of sin, that negates the reality of judgment. There are men who no longer believe in the ancient model of a warfare between an enemy who has rebelled against God and made man his target, an enemy that hates us with a passion simply because everything that he aspired to have in an antiquity beyond our knowledge he could not achieve because he was filled with pride and he was banished from heaven by God. That enemy, Satan, is now negated and denied in major quarters of the church. God's affirmation is I am that I am and his is that I am that I am not. Recently our nation was polarized in an unbelievable way when there was an exorcism that was shown by 2020 and after that exorcism Nightline took one of the leading liberal theologians from Notre Dame who scoffed and laughed and made fun of anyone who would believe that the devil was running around with his horns and a tail. If I had been invited to be there and I was not, I, I would not have been perhaps as courteous as that delightful priest from New York who so patiently endured the scholar, in quotes, question mark. <laughs> Brother, I would have quoted Cardinal Ratzinger, who is the guardian of our faith, who when the Ratzinger report was asked, what about those who deny that Satan exists? 
What about those theologians and major sections of the church that came alive with mockery when Paul VI affirmed that Satan is not just a literary device of sacred scripture, but he is an affirmed historical being and personage that evil is not the absence of good. It is personified in forces and personalities in a spiritual warfare that have determined that the church is their number one enemy. And you cannot go to Medjugorje or to any place where Our Lady is, but what you will encounter, that spiritual warfare, and you cannot listen to the messages of the Mother of God until you must make a decision. Either you believe that there is a war that is on and the enemy is real, or you have missed the whole point of what Christianity is all about. And His Eminence Cardinal Ratzinger made the statement, if there is a question of the reality of Satan, this is not a problem of learning, of academics, of scholarship. This is a problem of holiness. Because wherever Jesus Christ goes, He exposes Satan. He will not allow him to hide. And he says, if Jesus is there, you know Satan is there because the demons are the first to cry out and acknowledge him. And if there is any section of our church that says Satan is not there, you can be sure the Lord is not there in that section either. But when we want to know the objective level of our faith, we are immediately called that Our Lady goes from the narratives of the infancy straight to Calvary. Last year when I spoke, I shared with you how on the seventh anniversary when I said to Father Slavko, what is the meaning of these apparitions here in Medjugorje? Is it a new spirituality? Is it an old spirituality? What is happening here? And he said, it is old in that it is the Bible. It is new in that Mary is the teacher. When we built, he said, Krushapek, that cross at the top, little did we realize that the very geography of Medjugorje and its very location, its very structuring would itself be a living sermon. That everyone who comes here, young or old, will ascend and make the stations and go to that cross. That is where we are being called to the cross. Our Lady is saying we must go to the cross. We must go to the cross. There alone is salvation in the cross. There alone is personal conversion in the cross because Paul said it was in the cross that I am crucified to the world and the world to me. All value systems change at Calvary. There alone do you understand what the mystery of Christianity is all about that he is not just a great teacher, that he is not just a great philosopher, that Jesus Christ did not come simply to ignite a little spark of divinity in every man, but rather he came because he saw mankind as hopelessly lost in a morass of sin and a judgment and a brokenness, and the only thing that would save them was not a teaching, not a philosophy, but a Savior whose blood alone could atone for their sin and transform them from glory to glory until they were presented faultless before the throne of his father. In that first mystery, Our Lady takes us to a garden scene. This is the beginning of redemption. It was in a garden that the fall began. Thus the beginning of redemption will be marked by another garden. But this garden bears the name Gethsemane, the oil press, and here would be crushed for the healing of the world, the Lamb of God. 
The visionaries throughout the centuries have seen the struggle. As every demon in hell showing with every hideousness of sin that could possibly be portrayed and there taunting the Savior, will you take this sin upon yourself? But something very real is happening. We are told that the agony and the anguish of our Savior is so great that he cries, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If there was any other way, any other plan, any other hope for the world apart from the cross of Jesus Christ, the Father would have intervened at that moment. But he must drink that cup to the dregs. And that cup is the iniquity of a sinful and a broken world. And he will bleed, as it were, from the very poor's blood. When I go to the Old Testament, the type of sin that is portrayed for us there is leprosy because it mars, it disfigures the beauty of the human countenance. And so sin has marred and disfigured the image of God, the Imago Dei, that God had implanted in every soul. And so leprosy becomes the type of sin, and one of the symptoms of a leper in the Old Testament is he bleeds from the poor, and the Savior must become the divine leper to bring us salvation. In the conference in Northern California, I shuddered as I heard a theologian, supposedly curriculum writer, make the statement. He writes from Oregon, a junior high curriculum for the Catholic Church. We must jettison this teaching of the blood of the Lamb. We must forget the teaching of sin because sin is no longer relevant Yes, we have conveniently removed sin where we used to shudder at the cry adultery. We now call it looking for a meaningful relationship. We have found a new terminology that can make us very comfortable with sin. And so the writer said, let us jettison all of these things. They're not relevant. And let us just teach the junior high that Jesus is just a young man struggling like you who doesn't even know he's God till after the resurrection. How horrible. And this was no Unitarian conference. It was a Catholic diocese in California. Do you understand why Our Lady weeps? Do you see her pain? That we would lose the very meaning of the cross. I remember when I was a Presbyterian seminarian, Dr. Gerald Gerstner, a Jonathan Edwards scholar, came in to preach. Most of the seminarians were asleep. He looked over the crowd and he said, Every one of you in this room is a pervert. Everyone woke up. He laughed and he said, if I'd said you were sinners, <laughs> you'd still be sleeping. But the minute I introduced the most horrible word, pervert, perversion, it shocks you. And we need again to be shocked that sin is real and it is perversion and the only reason we are here 
is because on a mount called Calvary, God gave us a remedy for the curse of sin, a healing that would transform the human heart. And everyone who goes to Medjugorje must go climb that cross. And at midpoint to the cross, there is the fourth station where Mary visits her son. And he said, we did not know it, Father, but the hill of the apparitions is exactly parallel to the fourth station. She has come to be with us as she has called us back to the cross with her son. I went to the Carmelite convent in Lipa, the Philippines. I met later the next day the visionary that in 1948 the roses were falling in the visitations. The day that I went there, it was the feast of St. Alfonso Liguori, and I did not know it, but I preached on how the language of St. Alfonso Liguori has become so offensive to some modern people because it doesn't fit their understanding of God, and particularly priests and nuns have lost that sense of the old faith. And to my utter amazement, I had not read the messages given but the messages was the cry from the mother of God that it would be the priest and religious that would break her heart and that of her son because they would forsake the old ways. How much we've seen of it. But on the roses that would materialize and fall, the, uh, the uh, visionary said, I would just say to mother, they're falling again. There would be showers of rose petals. And the nuns picked them up and kept them. The nuns gave them to me, some of them. But then they would hold those petals up and see images of the crucifixion, images of Mary. They're unmistakable. I took large pictures of the blow-ups that were done. They were for our television work. It was amazing. And I shared with the sisters how that among the visionaries they were saying that when our Lord was carrying the cross he kept looking for his mother she was the only one who knew the only one from the beginning who knew and his eyes which were almost blinded from the swollen condition with those eyes barely able to see he searched through the crowd that day and then when he saw her he reached out, and that's the third station where he fell. He lost his balance as he reached for his mother, who quickly came to him in the fourth state station. After I had described that to the sisters of Carmel, I was holding one of the petals in my hand that a sister had given me, and I held it up to the light and the sister and I both almost cried. There was the image of the crucifixion shining through. That is our objective faith. We serve a Savior whose name is Jesus, and by the cross he has broken the powers of darkness. But that unknown is not enough. There must be a response. That is why it is I believe. And Mary is the total model of that response. At 3 o'clock this morning, I woke up and I heard a voice saying, I am the perfect response to God. And I knew Our Lady was there. Because she shows us the way of what a response to God means when she says, Be it done unto me according to your word. There is no reservation. It is not what I want. It is not God give me this, God give me that, but it is without reservation. Here is my life. It is in your hands, be it done unto me according to your will. And the church will never know the greatness of her calling until you and I put aside our selfish wishes, put aside our own ambition, and suddenly 
fall on our faces after the model of our mother and cry, not my will, not what I want, but let me have only your will, Father. Let me do your bidding without commitment. I am yours. That is what she asked of us. And that is what she's longing for. To teach us that the act of the will. And you know, it is interesting that there are two Greek words, logos and rima. And the rima is the anointed word that comes to you. The whole model of salvation is seen in Mary in that event of the Annunciation. For God comes to every one of us for one reason, that we are to bear Christ to the world. It is this uniqueness that caused the council to give to Mary the title Theotokos at Ephesus, the God-bearer. It is amazing to me that I had a Protestant who wrote me a letter telling me how much she liked our station, KNXT, but she had the following reservations. And she thought it was awful that we Catholics would call Mary the mother of God when it was obvious she was not the mother of God, she was the mother of Jesus. And so I had to say that this is so typical of the superficial response of Protestants who have never done their homework in church history. Because the church at Ephesus was fighting a battle that we are fighting right now. Arianism has come back. I can take you to a place in Northern California where we have a marvelous Carmelite convent that I have gone to speak to the sisters there and they have perpetual adoration. It is one of my favorite places. And just a few blocks away, I can take you to a Catholic seminary where they are scoffing at the perpetual adoration and jokingly call it cookie worship. When you hear that in a seminary, you know why we don't have vocation. God will send no one who is thirsting for a knowledge of him to a dry well. And if I sound that I'm hard on the church, let me tell you, God is cleaning seminaries up in the most marvelous way imaginable. And one of the most thrilling things I have found was that just recently I was in Canada where we have a new order of priests called Companions of the Cross that is 100% charismatic. And it is growing every day and almost it has as many seminarians in the seminary as the entire diocese and every priest is worried that the charismatic order may take over the whole diocese and that it is totally Marian. That Our Lady today is creating sons and daughters to go into the religious life and into the seminary that are being in the house of formation that is so totally Marian and so aware of the supernatural that they'll shock some of the professors <laughs> when they get there. But Arianism is alive. There are those humanizing Jesus. And so at that council of Ephesus, the Arians wanted him to be married to be declared the mother of Jesus. But it was a crowd outside of laity that would not let go of his deity, that demanded that he had to be called, that she had to be called the mother of God. And thank God she is the mother of God. And that's why we are here. then as we look at all of this and realize its implications 
when we make that act of the will, something begins to happen. And what begins to happen is so wonderful. We begin to triumph. Suddenly, when we make that act of the will without reservations, things begin to happen in our lives. And we begin to realize that this kingdom is for real because it's happening. And that's the next aspect of faith. For the next aspect of faith is that we move from an act of the will to the encounter. It is interesting that in Cardinal Ratzinger's work, he talks about the fact that there is always the tension that God never gives you so much that you have to believe. That our statement, I believe, has merit because it becomes an act of faith, an act in which we have two options and we make the decision that we're going to believe. And once we have made that decision, there is always hauntingly hanging over us the other option. And he uses a marvelous illustration, the fact that of all of the saints of our church, Teresa of Lisieux, that the little flower was so nurtured almost as if you would speak of her as a plant in a hothouse, that her family environment was Catholic, totally committed to the church, and that she quickly went from there to a convent, totally committed to the faith, and died at such a young age. And the cardinal laments that the order tried to repress the fact that in the last years of her life, she spoke of the unbelievable temptation to atheism, to believe it was not true. And he said they should have never repressed that because there is always that tension that maybe this isn't true. Maybe it isn't real. But that it works on both ways. Martin Buber, who was one of the greatest of the Jewish existential theologians, famous for his work, The I Thou, tells of an atheist who challenged all of the great rabbis of Europe. And finally, he finds the one rabbi that he has not been able to have a confrontation, but he has been warned of him. And when he gets to that rabbi, the rabbi simply looks at him and he says, what if it is true? He says, what? He said, you want me to present to you the kingdom of God as my predecessors tried to do on a platter and I cannot do it. All I can say is what if it is true? What if it is true? There is one woman whom I've come to appreciate as a really dynamic Christian. And many of you may remember her. She was the co-host of the 700 Club, Club Denuda Soderman. I know the story of Danuta. She was brought up with a Jewish father. She had a Catholic education because her father was Polish and they were living in the woods and the rabbi, or rather the priest came, the Monsignor came and he saw these poor children living in, in poverty and he took them in and made sure that they got a Catholic education. But as she grew up, she's a very scholarly lady. And so she was reading Nietzsche and she was reading at the same time C.S. Lewis. And she was puzzled that if God didn't exist, why was Nietzsche so mad at him? <laughs> and C.S. Lewis seemed to make so much more sense. And so she met a friend of mine, Harold Bradison, and she said, well, I want you to answer this, and I want you to answer this, and I want you to answer this. And Harold refused to answer any of her questions. And this troubled her that she could not get an answer. And she said, but I need to know these things in order to make a commitment. And he looked at her and he said, you need nothing but a commitment. Do you want Jesus or not? If you want him, take him now as your Savior. Make the commitment and go with it. She says, all right, I'll make the commitment. Let's go with it. <laughs> and I say that because this is the way it has often been. That you wonder. But there are times in our lives where the questioning leaves. For me, the greatest period of questioning that I could have ever lived through was when I was told that I had terminal cancer 
and that I was about to die. And suddenly every unbelief, every question that had been in the depth of my mind that I did not care to deal with came up to haunt me. Is it all real? Is it all real? Or is it a fantasy? Is there really a God? Is his name really Jesus? Is the church valid? Is all of this for real? And part of my questioning had come from being exposed to various aspects of psychology and parapsychology and other fields. And I realized that there's only one place you find the answer, and that is when you go to the Lord. And the Lord came through in such a way that death itself had to stop its process in my body as his resurrection life touched me. And when I was told that I would have only a year to live, I'm here 11 years later and I know I believe, I believe, I believe. So what am I saying to you now? I am saying that there can be those questions, those doubts, and that you and I have lived in a church that we thought would never question. But we hear sections questioning, and it has become difficult for us because St. Paul says, unless the trumpeter blow a clear call, how shall we prepare for battle? How many of you have had your hearts converted at Medjugorje only to find a pastor who was indifferent to you? How many of you have wanted a prayer group only to find others have no time for you? How many of you are struggling and wondering about it all and you hear all of these diverse voices, a cophony of sound that is almost deafening and a continual questioning? And whenever that happens, you can be sure of one thing. The book of Revelation tells us that when Satan shall come in like a flood against the woman and her seed, she will go to be in the wilderness with them. And why, why, why is everywhere you turn today, not only in Medjugorje, but in San Francisco, because there Our Lady just recently had an apparition and I did not even know about it until I went there to the Philippines and, and Bert Rivera, one of my best friends, a man I came to love so deeply, a very scholarly and a wonderful man, but a totally committed Christian. And he told me how he had gone to the section of San Francisco where they said the apparition would happen. And on that day, they spent all of the day there and by midnight nothing seemingly was going to happen and they'd said there'd be a rainbow in the sky and then she would appear so at 15 minutes to 12 he said this mob of over 200 people 250 people said they'll go wild when Mary doesn't appear let's get out of here and he went home but his daughter stayed and at 2.30 Mary appeared they had the rainbow and she came down and every one of the 250 people saw Our Lady But he said, I missed it and I felt so bad that I had missed it just a few minutes. If I'd have stayed longer, I would have seen the mother of God. And I went to confession and I cried to Father Tarantino. And he said, well, Our Lady knows that it's what's in your heart, Bert. But then a few nights later, she was standing there again and people were seeing her and they called Bert Rivera up and they said, Mary's here, come quickly. He put his pants on over his pajamas, grabbed his wife, got in the car. It takes 30 minutes to get there. He got there in 15, and he ran into the garden, and there, he said, was the lady waiting on him, waiting to show him who she was, beautifully dressed in blue and a white veil. And he said, when those eyes of Our Lady looked at me, she didn't have to say a word. I knew what I knew. I knew he was real. I knew heaven was real. I knew Mary was real. And I knew my life would only have peace if it was totally committed to them. And I want to serve him in every way that I can. I want to be committed to the mother of God. And I am saying to you, what is happening today? We are having rosaries that are turning to gold. I even blessed a sack in Houston and seven of them turned to gold in the sack. 
I was over at one woman's house, Elaine's house that I was with over in the Philippines and her heart had been converted and she brought a Protestant movie producer over from next door. And he was so skeptical about this thing. He said, I'm not involved in marrying apparitions. And her aunt had given me a silver sterling, silver rosary to dedicate to bless that had large rosaries on it. And I'm talking to this man holding the rosary. And while I'm talking to him, my hand burns. I said, what's happening? And I opened my hand and all of the beads in my hand had turned to pink gold and his eyes bugged out as we watched the whole thing turn to gold. The next thing that happened, we had seven rosaries turn to grow and the maids brought me the plastic ones just in case to bless. Now you say, what does all that mean? I read an article by a man who was skeptical of Marian apparitions in the National Catholic Reporter. He said, yes, I went to Medjugorje. Yes, I stood there and saw the sun dance. I saw every bit of the phenomenon they're talking about. And no, I don't want to believe in apocalyptic messages. And I wished I hadn't seen it because I'm very uncomfortable because I saw it and I don't want to believe it. And I didn't want to believe it then, but I'd have to say those people are seeing something because I saw what they saw. But I don't like what I saw. It upsets me. But I'm going to tell you that those who are praying the rosary, those who are trying to believe, those who don't understand what is happening in the midst of this world, and those that are worried, has the faith changed? Has there a different worldview? Or is it what we have always believed in, the faith once delivered to the saints? When you hear the message of Medjugorje, it is an affirmation. The God of the Bible has not changed. It is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And yes, my child, it is real. When you pray, you'll transform the world. Your rosaries become gold. Why? Because I'm calling you to a ministry of intercession. And when you begin to pray, we will bring down the strongholds of Satan. The war is on. It is being fought in every parish and in every diocese. But we are not alone. Our mother has come to be with us in the wilderness. Many of you know the vision of Leo the 13th. It means his time is about up, the evil one. The tide is changing. We're going to see Jesus on the front page of the newspaper in place of Satan. When I got into the car in Cebu, I just landed, got off the plane, flew to Cebu for a rally. We were going to a rally of a crowd bigger than the group that's here today with no air conditioning. For eight hours, they had sat there, every seat taken to pray and hear speakers. There were some very dynamic looking young Filipinos in the van and I said, who are you? And they said, we're movie actors. When they arrived, the crowd went wild, especially the teenagers. And then I discovered that as I listened to these beautiful performers, that 75% of the movie industry in the Filipinos have been, in the Philippines have been converted to Christ and they're changing the media there. <laughs> In 
And it brings us back to the most glorious thing. Our Lady has said, I have come that you might know that God exists. But if you read ahead in the book, you'll discover we're going to win. My last trip to Yugoslavia, we went to Zagreb. We went in the cathedral. They just had elections. The communists only got 13% of the vote. The parliament met as a body, convened, and without dismissing, marched to that cathedral and received the sacrament to declare that atheism had ended in Croatia. The lines are drawn, and our lady is saying, be my children. Pray with me. The last message of Medjugorje as it was given to us as I left the Philippines was you have prayed a little, but you must pray and fast even harder. The battle is becoming more intense. Yes, I pick up journals that are attacking Medjugorje. <laughs> but I want to tell you, if the enemy didn't attack it, I wouldn't believe it's real. And so, I'm going to shock everyone today. I'm going to end on time. <laughs> I knew I had jet lag. <laughs> but I'd like for you to say a prayer with me. We'll say the three Hail Marys and the glory be to the Father. But it is a prayer of Our Lady Mary, Mediatrix of all grace, that has been restored by the Archbishop of Lipa. When I met with the Cardinal, the last parting words I said to His Eminence Cardinal Sin, what would be your final message to people listening? And the Cardinal said to me, he said, Father, when I was a seminarian, I had a devotion to Our Lady. My last days in seminary, I became very ill with a lung disease. I could not make my studies, and my professor said, Don't worry, Sin, you've done very well. We will let you be ordained. But he said they had a brand new image of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal, and they sang to that new image put in the chapel and when everyone left I remained before Our Lady's image and I said if my lungs do not clear by this date I will know I have no more voc vocation and that I'm not called to be a priest and I will not trouble you are the diocese but mother if I am to be a priest, please heal me by that date. And he said, I wrote all of this in my commitment to Mary. And he said, I used my own blood to sign it, and I put it behind the medal. He said, 18 years later, they cleaned the medal and found my note, and I was healed and now a cardinal of the church. But he said, that letter represented my own experience of her. He said, every night I open the window and I call out, Maria, Maria, because I want to talk to her. And my secretary said, who is this strange woman you talk to at night? And he said, I told him, none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But he said, Father, we had 16 children. And my daddy could only give me $15 a month for the seminary. He said, it's hard to be a seminarian on $15 a month. And I wrote my father and I said to him, Daddy, I have to have more than $15. I can't make ends meet at the seminary. And my father wrote me back, Son, there's 16 of you. Live with $15 a month. So then I wrote my mother. And I said to her, Mother, you always said you loved me the most because I was the sickly, weak one in the family and that I would be your servant for God. But I can't do this on $15 a month. And when my mother was through with my father, he sent me $100 a month. So he said, I have learned the power of a mother. <laughs> the Protestants were protesting where that shrine of Our Lady of Peace that marked the transition of the nation was there. The protest had big signs. The worship of Mary is idolatry. She will be spoken against, even as her son was spoken against. But this I leave with you, the findings of one of our Catholic biblical scholars, George Montague. If we speak of Jesus as being great David's greater son, if we hear what the angel said to Mary, he shall reign from the throne of David his father, then we must go back and study the structure of the court of Judah, of the kings of Judah. The wives of the king, the queens, were so diverse and of many cultures and verse, diverse in number simply because of the political necessities. None of the queens therefore held a high place in the court because no one knew from which of them would come the king. But the second most powerful figure in all of the kingdoms from David's kingdom on was the queen mother. And often she reigned as regent. But if you could not get to the king, you could get to the queen mother. She was the most influential person in the whole court because she was the mother of the king. Yes, he reigns from David's throne, and yes, she is the queen mother, the most influential person in the court of heaven. And so stand with me that I may keep my commitment to get you out on time. I will pray the memory with you. And you know, when I answered that Protestant woman, they found a fragment of this in Egypt with the word deliver used as it was with the new, as the Lord's Prayer. And the dating of that fragment, papyrus fragment, is early second century. That is almost apostolic that the church was already recording its prayers to Our Lady. Let us make our commitment to her. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection implored your help and sought your intercessions was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, I fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To you do I come. Before you I stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in your mercy hear and answer me. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O most powerful mediatrix, pray for us. The response that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. O Lord Jesus Christ, our mediator with the Father, who has appointed the most blessed virgin, your mother, to be our mother also, and our mediatrix before you, grant that whoever draws near to you to beseech any benefit may rejoice to receive all things through her who lives and reigns with God the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. I have come to tell you that God exists. Amen, amen. I believe in one God. Amen. I will lead you now in your life offering so that this mystery is a total presentation of your life to God. This is the form of the life offering if you'd like to repeat it after me in order to invest this decade of the rosary with a very real presentation of yourself to God. And Our Lady promises in our way that the day we make our life offering, she will obtain because of our life offering the release of any family members in purgatory and no member of our own family will be lost in hell, she says, although it may appear otherwise, because because of her life offering, she will touch them with the grace of conversion, even if it's at the final moments of their lives. So this is the form, if you like to repeat it with me. Sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary, for the adoration and supplication of the Most Holy Trinity for the conversion of sinners for the Holy Father for unity in Holy Mother Church for the bishops, priests and religious and for holy vocations and for the good of souls until the end of the world I offer you myself all that I have and all that I am all that I have suffered and have still to endure all my good deeds past and future all the holy masses I have attended and have yet to offer. 
all the Holy Communions I have received and am still to receive. O Sacred Heart of Jesus, keep me faithful to my life offering. Chaste spouse of Mary, Saint Joseph, present this my life offering to your immaculate spouse, to the joy of all the angels and saints. Everything now belongs to Our Lady, and she says, if you never think of it again, everything is hers. But she likes us to renew it frequently, so 